One of the biggest inherent problems with finally getting your hands on a, an iconic car, classic or otherwise, and you can see evidence of this happening all the time in the JDM world now, where stuff like Skylines and Supras are fetching Mercedes SLR McLaren and Lamborghini Diablo prices, well, sure, you might love them, and the nostalgia has a lot to say there, but it can lead to a car being so overhyped that, to no fault of the car's own, when you finally end up driving one, you could think, well, okay, I get it, but... It's not that level that people are hyping it up to. So when I was actually very kindly offered by a local neighbour of mine the chance to drive his E30, a 320i four-door saloon version in particular, a 1989 car that you can see here, of course I jumped at the chance because I haven't driven an M3 of this generation yet. But one very curious bit of information that I heard from a former M3 owner is that as much as he liked it, he personally found that they are overhyped these days. And if that is the top of the tree of the E30 generation, at least for many people, how would a more normal, more mainstream, more daily driver approach, more of a family car in the E30 range such as this one, fare in comparison? On the one hand, you could think it doesn't stand a chance because it doesn't have 235 horsepower, the touring car DNA, etc. But then on the other hand, because the stakes are lower and because it has more practicality in its favor, it could actually make up for it. And incidentally, for any who are maybe perusing YouTube through E30 reviews because you're thinking of buying one, he's actually selling this exact car. So I've put his email down in the description, and of course you can get in contact with him. I'll probably update the description once the car sells, so if the email's still there, then chances are the car is still available. This particular car, as I said, is a 1989 320i. Now the E30 actually ran from 1982 through to 1994, so a pretty good run, and it had a couple of updates and facelifts here and there, probably most notably in 1980 where of course they added the touring version, aka the wagon or a state car. They got rid of a lot of the chrome that the older cars had, kind of toned down and smoothed off the styling a little bit, made some mechanical improvements, some rust protection improvements, and as with many classics, rust does tend to be one of the things that you'll want to have a look at in many cases, depending of course on the country. If it comes from Japan, for example, you'll probably be okay because they don't salt the roads. Again, it's a case-by-case -case basis from the climate that the car will have come from. Now these were available available primarily with either four or five speed manuals. This particular one has the five speed. There were automatic versions as well, both ZFs, a three speed and a four speed auto. Now, like I said, I was driving the five speed manual. It has an interesting little, uh, very German, I guess, very European reverse, wherein you essentially push it into the same position as first gear, but you have to push it further over to the left until you feel it click. Sounds like something which you would definitely not want to get wrong, which is true, but thankfully the way it works, you can't really mistake it for reverse. You really have to push it over there. I was more concerned that it might have that Top Gear Mercedes 190 style dog leg, which would make it a bit awkward and throwing the car backwards. But thankfully, I think BMW kind of saw that coming and added just that little safety feature to make it a bit better. In terms of size, I was actually surprised just how compact this car is because the three series, yes, it's the smaller of the range. Of course, you've got the three, the five, and the seven. Personally, I've always loved the seven series. I think it's a great looking car, especially the classics, and it's very big. That's the flagship. The five series, of course, is legendary as well, especially the M5. The 3 Series, I personally find I think of the 3 Series of this shape more as a two-door, and that's probably because of the M3. But of course there are loads of different variations. I mentioned earlier on they introduced the wagon, which of course is a five-door. You've got the four-door like this one. There's the two-door convertible and the two-door coupe, which of course the M3 is based on. So there's really something for everyone in the E30 range, and that was kind of the point. It was designed to be that mass-selling mainstream BMW. And that's exactly what it did. But even here, in four-door form, it is quite a compact car. I was surprised just how compact it was, even by British standards, because our roads are, of course, a lot narrower. It's 176 inches long, 65 inches wide. So it's really not that big. In terms of space, though, and this is actually one of my favourite things about a classic, because the pillars in particular are a lot smaller than the massive, thick, blind spot pillars which many modern cars have, because the roof line tends to be a little bit higher, in relation to the width and the length. More often than not, you'll find that a smaller car, especially a classic, and in some cases kind of a retro modern like 90s or very early 2000s car, will have a lot more space inside than you would think they would from the outside. On the topic of space though, that is pretty much my only primary gripe with this car. Two things in particular. One, you can kind of deal with, and the way that BMW deals with it I find interesting. It's kind of this uh, common theme that they've got working through in a couple of ways, because the first one, as you would expect from me, is headroom. Now you can see in the 
the video, it looks like I've got just about enough room, and of course I'm not the smallest of drivers, so yeah, it does have just about enough. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the kind of car I'd want to take on a really long journey. Again, for anyone under six foot, you'll be fine. The thing which I found quite cool is that when you adjust the seat to lower it, it doesn't just go down, it feels like it has this motion where it kind of goes down and then rotates back just a little bit as if it's moving over a hump. And it reminds me of how BMW also does that with the bonnet opening, where it clicks forward a little bit and then you swing it up. It's like BMW had this fascination with double hinges at the time for some reason, but it's cool. It gives it a very satisfying ergonomic feel. The second thing, and this I think is actually more of an issue, is the clutch pedal. Now the brake pedal and accelerator pedal, I didn't find this an issue at all, but with the clutch, especially when of course you're pushing it all the way in, I found that my foot was getting caught <laughs> and it didn't happen all the time. But again, it's a bigger guy problem with bigger feet, bigger shoes. But I found that my shoe would get jammed straight upright between the dash and the floor. And for many people, that's not going to be a problem because most people probably don't have size 12, 13 feet. But if you do, then that is something to bear in mind. Now, again, I want to stress it wasn't happening to the point of feeling unsafe. It happened maybe three times in the entire time I was driving it. So once again, it's more of a personal thing. I wouldn't knock it against the car. What then about the engine? Because of course, the different names in the 3 Series lineage, 318, 320, 325, etc. It all refers to the engine, as many different German cars do. Mercedes has their equivalent, etc. This particular one, being a 320i, as you would expect, is a 2-litre. Curiously, though, and this is something which I really like about classics, they would use stuff like a straight five or a straight six almost just for the sake of it sometimes. And of course, having more pistons and more cylinders makes your engine more smooth. And this is a prime example of that because this is such a smooth two litre, probably one of the most effortless two litre engines certainly in the more normal car segment that I've ever driven. It doesn't feel like it's ever working that hard, and that's great because, again, it's a comfortable, relaxing daily. At the same time, though, it definitely isn't slow. Even though this is, I guess you could say, one of the lower models in the range, that 2.0-litre straight six, which is an M20 designation engine in particular, on paper, it doesn't sound that impressive. It's only got about 95 kilowatts, which is 127 horsepower. And in terms of torque, it's not that crazy either, 120 one foot pounds. Peak power is at 6,000 RPM, peak torque just over 4,000. So in both cases, that's 164 newtons of torque, 95 kilowatts of power. It's nothing crazy. These days that would be like a lower level hot hatch. But the fact that these E30s were never that heavy, and as mentioned before, they're very compact, it kind of starts to blend together when you first drive the car, certainly for me, you very quickly start to feel, okay, I get it. I get why this was such a good touring car. I get why it was so popular, and I do understand why it had such great potential for motorsport, and certainly why BMW has generated such a reputation for making these fantastic driver's cars. It is a very nice car to drive, and some of my favorite things about driving it were, first things first, this really was the initial thing that I noticed, the gear changes. I think the best way to describe it, especially in comparison to something like my own five-speed manual, which I've got, which is the little Daihatsu Rally, that car has a very aggressive, very chunky, very mechanical gearbox, which kind of makes sense for the rally underpinnings. You really have to jam it into each gear, and it's a lot of fun. That's kind of the approach that you'd have. With this car, you wouldn't really want that. And the way that it feels, to go back to that double hinge feeling, kind of feels like BMW is doing a similar thing again. It feels like there's almost this clunk click approach to each gear where the shifter is doing some of the work for you. It almost feels like a pneumatic shifter. And I'm not entirely sure what approach BMW was taking there because obviously I haven't stripped one down and looked, but it's a very satisfying gear change and it feels great to use. The clutch is also fantastic and the power is actually quite deceptive because more often than not, I would find myself looking down and doing 60, 65 miles an hour after just some relatively brief acceleration and the engine, because it's so smooth, and I think being that straight six is probably part of the reason why, it's deceptively quick. It's not a fast car in conventional terms. You're not going to break a lap record, for example, with it, but it's a car which creeps up on you in terms of how quick it is. It has enough power to more than get the job done and have a lot of fun while doing so. And that brings me to another thing which I really liked as well. And this is something which, even having not driven an M3, I could definitely feel how it would transfer over to that car and be one of its best strengths, especially for motorsport use, and that is how light and loose the car feels. That's a fine line. You can very easily move into the territory of being skittish or feeling like you're not in control enough. I don't like a car that feels like it floats around all over the road. With a classic, it's not quite the same, because when you're driving it, you immediately can feel, okay, 
This is loose and it's precise and it's sharp because it's so light. There's nothing fancy going on electronically, it's just a good old fashioned mechanical reason. It's a small, light car with a high revving straight six. Of course it's going to feel light, loose, and great through corners. Now to go back to that engine for a second, as I said it is an M20, that means a cast iron block, aluminium head, single overhead cam, and two valves per cylinder. Uses rockers as well, old school. Probably think of that as being more of an American thing, but hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's a lovely engine. In practice it feels great, it looks nice under the bonnet as well, and even the idea of a straight six for the most part is kind of a lost art. You had some for Japan like the Skyline etc but in general not really anymore. In terms of wrapping up my final thoughts and my last good point and maybe not so good point I would say that my final good point that I want to bring out is that this one to me it offers an insight into why this car is as beloved as it is. Having grown up in a, in a time when my dad had cars that would have been similar to this but like Britain's equivalent like a he had a 1982 Vauxhall Cavalier 6 1600 for example, which of course didn't feel as sharp or as quick as this, wasn't on the same level, but even other smaller classics like that, or a Triumph Dolomite that a friend used to have, these kind of more affordable entry level four door approaches to a family car, of varying sizes of course, I, I think the Cavalier might have been a bit bigger, of course the Dolomite was a bit smaller, but across the board they have such a wildly different approach to the same essential concept of a four door family car. At the same time though, some of them clearly have more aspirations than others. There's a difference between making a car that's just designed to sell well and be just a car, if you will, and a car which has, well, as I said, more aspirations, a car which is trying to be more than just that. And you can, you know, uh, hype be damned, you can feel that, to be honest. I think you genuinely can feel the underpinnings of why this became such a good platform, and why it became such a legendary one, such a popular one, and why their prices are going up accordingly. In the case of this one, no, it isn't an M3, but unlike an M3, you're probably getting 35, 40 to the gallon out of it, you got the four doors instead of two, decent space in the back for kids, good boot space, and I would wager it's probably a heck of a lot more reliable than a lot of stuff which we had in Britain, certainly from the time, such as perhaps maybe even the ones I mentioned earlier. In terms of the last, not even downside, this is just something to take note of I would say, I'll call it the E30 effect, and this is basically what I've been going back to through the entire video, the hype of certain models, and it does, for obvious reasons, tend to be the performance models, uh, you know, the rising tide raises all ships, is it essentially what happens here. The prices of those going so crazy does have an effect on other models as well, and it's obvious why. If you're someone who desperately wants that particular car but you can't afford one, well then naturally you're going to try and get the closest thing to it. That's great for a seller's market, but for a buyer's market, it just means that it's not even a case of is the car worth it, it's a case of making sure that it is the car for you rather than just getting something purely because you're desperate to. So make sure you carry out the right checks. Look for rust. Check out what the car drives like. Make sure it isn't clunky. See if the brakes are good, suspension's good. Check out the bodywork. And more importantly than anything, and this applies for modern and classic, just see if the car's been loved. This example clearly has. I know from talking to the chap, he got it from a family-owned situation where they'd loved the car and not really used it all that much. It had been used enough to keep it good, but only around 94, 95,000 miles on the clock really isn't that much for a 1989 car. Plus it comes after 1987, so you have the advantage of those updates here and there, visually and mechanically. And overall, I would say that for my first E30 experience, I liked it quite a bit. I think it is a car which has a lot to offer and in particular, it has that thing which I love about all classics, charm. It has so much charm, and charm more often than not, even in the case of once again my own Lincoln, the Rolls, whichever, charm will appeal to me more than pure performance every single time. I've owned cars which are a heck of a lot quicker than my Lincoln Continental, such as the Bentley Flying Spur or the Supercharged Jag XKR, but they're not even close to the amount of fun that I get just from sitting in that burbly old American brute and just having fun because it's just charming. This in a distinctly more compact European way where it's uh, making every drive feel like you're flying through the Alps. It's so much fun because just like the Daihatsu, to go back to that one again, you don't need all the power in the world if it's just fun to drive. It's also the same reason why I love the Fiat Panda so much, the 100 HP. Doing more with what you've got is better nine times out of 10 than just having all the power you can possibly get. 
To me, this car has plenty of charm. I really enjoy driving it. And for a first E30 experience, it certainly, if nothing else, makes me more inclined to want to drive other versions in the future. And of course, like I said, if you do like this particular car, and if on the chance that it is still available, of course, it won't be around forever, send them an email down in the description. And of course, I would love to hear, this is where you guys come in who have owned these before. Maybe you had good stories, bad stories, maybe warning points for people to look out for. Drop it down in the comments. But of course, I'll see you next time with more reviews. Check out the Beards and Cars playlist for my other classic and modern car reviews. And until then, I'll see you next time. But for now, thanks for watching.